pastor of the church of Ephesus, right? These things says the one that holds the seven stars in his hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works. Everybody say works. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. I want you to notice before I go any further, verse number two, Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, I know your works. I recognize your works. I see what you're doing. Verse number three says, and us born and as patience, Jesus saying, you've had patience, you've had persistence, you've had endurance, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. You've worked and worked and worked. You've done good. You haven't gave, gave up yet. Verse 4, Jesus says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. All these verses are important here, and this is what I want to preach this morning on these three things, works, endurance, and love. These things are important in our lives. Got to have them. You got to have works. The scripture says faith without works is dead. So if all you have is just faith, you've got, or all, you ha- all you've got is just faith and you don't have any works and you've got dead faith. Amen. I don't want dead faith. I want living faith. Faith without works is dead. So you got to have works. You got to have endurance. You got to have persistence. You got to keep pressing on. Amen. Keep running. Keep swimming. Keep going. Put one foot in front of the other. And not only do you have to have works and endurance, you got to have love. Because if you don't have love, then your endurance don't matter. If you don't have love, then your works don't matter. Let's pray. Let's pray together. How about that? Heavenly Father, we love you today. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you for showing up here this morning, blessing the choir, blessing in Sunday school. Blessing the musicians and everything that's been said so far. I pray that you'd let the, the good spirit of God to continue to flow through this service. I pray you'd bless the kids as they've gone back and they're doing their lesson. And I pray that everything that I say, God, would be blessed. And I pray that you put a filter over my mind, put a filter over my mouth. Let me do no damage to your word. But I ask you, God, that you'd let me give to the church what you've given me so that we be encouraged, so that we be inspired, so we learn something from the word of God. I pray that you'd help me. Let the power of the Holy Ghost do your work, God, and help us today. Help me in Jesus' name. And we love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen. Amen. So Jesus says, you can be seated. Jesus says, I know your works. Jesus says that seven different times to each of the churches. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying, I know what you've done. I know what you've done. Now, a lot of times if you hear that, you may think that that's in a negative connotation. But I want to look at it in a positive light, that God has seen what we have done. Many, many, but, but I think we should look at this different. God sees how we have made a difference. God's looking at the church of Ephesus and saying, I see the works and the labor that you have, have done. And, and, you know, I, was, I, was, I had to go to Goldsboro to, to base the other day, and I was riding in my vehicle, and I was thinking, think about the church, think about what we're doing here as a church. And I was thinking, what difference? What difference is this church making? What are we doing? Does our works make any difference? And I was praying, seeking God, even while I was riding down the road. You know, you can drive and pray at the same time. Do you know that? And um, God, it seemed like God unzipped heaven. It seemed like God just just loaded me down with remembrance of the things that this church over the years have done good for for the glory of God and I want to let you know everything that we do at this church everything that we've done throughout this this church's establishment and this church the Raleigh Church of God Capital City Church of God and whatever all the previous names did you know that this church has been established since 1932 did you know that that's a mighty long time and one of these days uh, this church and you weren't around then I don't know if you were around that some maybe I don't know maybe you were let me get away from that um, but listen one of these days we're gonna have a hundred year anniversary for the existence of this Raleigh Church of God Capital City Church of God and I was thinking over the years with there's been a lot of different pastors A lot of different people that have done really, really good at this church. And whenever I'm done, there's going to be another pastor who's going to come and do some good things. But I want to let you know, we have done some good works for the glory of God. How many believes that here this morning? Because this is the thing, the devil all the time in your life individually and in my life individually and in the life of this church, the devil will always try to make you and I feel like that we're just not doing nothing, that we haven't done anything, that what we exist for doesn't make 
make any difference. And I want to tell you that there's some things that God has blessed this church with. And I just want to give them to you this morning. This is a little bit of a, the state of this church this morning. There have been marriages, listen to this, that have been on the brink of disaster throughout this church. But God has brought them back together because you as a church have prayed and come together as a body of believers and lifted each other up. Did you realize that? Now some of these things you may not realize, but this has happened at this church. There have been healings, miraculous healings that have taken place in this church. Sick people have walked into this church on Sunday mornings and we may have not have seen it, may have not have, it may have not been so evident that we've seen it, but sick people have walked in and healed people have walked out. And I believe that's a, a good work that we can praise God for. There has been encouragements. Maybe you come on a Sunday morning and you listen to the message and you got encouraged. And I want to tell you what, when you're discouraged and you're down, just a little bit of encouragement is worth more than a million dollars sometimes. Maybe you've been encouraged. Maybe you hear a song on a Sunday morning. Maybe you came on a Wednesday night and you received encouragement from the classes. Maybe something's happened when you brought your little kid and dropped them off to a class and that something the kid brought and told you, maybe that blessed you. I want to let you know, don't let the devil tell you that we haven't done anything. Don't let the devil tell you that you hadn't done anything. Jesus says, I see your good works. There's been encouragements. Not only that, we've tried to inspire people. I try to inspire people all the time with, with what I preach. And sometimes it's inspiring. Sometimes I, I don't try to inspire you. Sometimes because inspiration will leave you real quick. Do you know that? I try to give you some, some, some instruction. Some gospel. Because if you leave here and you got instruction, you got teaching, it'll stick to your ribs. It'll stay with you. So I try to inspire. We try to inspire. But we try to teach and we try to give you the gospel. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation. I try my best to preach the word. To be instant, in season and out of season. Pastor Brandon, he preaches the word. He's instant, in season and out of season. We rebuke, we reprove with all long suffering and doctrine. These are the words that Jesus is saying that I, I see that you're doing we have given finan this church as a whole has given financially has given financially we don't just receive on Sunday morning we, we don't just receive and receive and just hold it and store it all up we have given hundreds of thousands of dollars to home missions to world missions. And that's something that we ought to be thankful for this morning. We don't just receive. We give and we give and we give and we give. When COVID hit, and we all know what happened when COVID hit, we tried our best. Me and Pastor Brandon and Hannah and the staff and the leadership at church, we tried our best to make sure that we was engaging you and doing our best for you. We would come in here Sunday after Sunday after Wednesday after Wednesday. Sometimes I'd come in here and Pastor Brandon would come in here and he preached to a camera. That's hard. Hard. Have you ever preached to a camera before? That's hard. We preached the empty pews, but we did it. And I want to tell you something. During COVID, there was a mass exodus of ministers that had never been before because people just give it up. They just given up. They're just throwing in the towel. But we didn't give up. We kept on pressing. We kept on doing the best. We had church in the yard. We had church. We had to wear masks. We had to do everything. But I want to let you know that sometimes we think, God, do you see what we do for you? God, do you hear me when I pray? God, do you notice what I do? But Jesus said, to the church of Ephesus I see your works and let me tell you something this morning your works are important what you do for God that's real important there'll be something to tell you you don't matter what you do don't matter how you live but I'll tell you this right more this morning it does matter what you do and it does matter how you live it does matter how you conduct your life and it does matter that you take care of your responsibilities because you got to be a man of God you got to be a woman of God you've got to do what you know to do the neighborhood got shot up you remember that I mean it was just a couple months ago and I was talking to Pastor Brandon I said man me and you has went through more in the past three years than some pastors have went through their entire ministry. What do you do whenever your neighborhood gets shot up as a church that's right in the neighborhood? We led a, a candlelight vigil. We organized a candlelight vigil. Had hundreds of people out there. And I, I'm telling you all this, church, not to boast. But I am boasting a little bit, but I'm boasting for the glory of God. I want to let you know it's for the glory of God. Everything that we do, I don't do it just for me. I don't do it to get paid. I do it because I love God and I praise God and I give Him the glory. 
I've been called upon. Talking about works this morning. I've been called upon to stand before Raleigh City Council and pray. And I bought, brought prayers in Jesus' name to this city. You as a church, you as a church, think about this now. You enable me. You support me as the United States Air Force chaplain for me to take the gospel down there to Seymour Johnson and to take the gospel wherever they may send me. And when I put on that uniform and I got a cross right here on my chest, I'm not just carrying the cross for Jesus. I'm carrying the cross to represent this church that you have enabled me and you haven't supported me to do. Jesus sees that. Jesus knows that. Jesus understands that. And I want you to know this morning that your works are extremely important to the first furtherance of the gospel and the furtherance of this church. Praise God. Jesus says, I know your works. I see your works. And you might say, Pastor, you're boasting. You're exactly right. I'm boasting. I'm boasting in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 and 31 says, he that boasts, let him boast in the Lord. I mean, we can't do any of this stuff without God. And it's a sorry frog that won't croak for his own pond. And this morning, I'm just croaking a little bit. And I'm just telling you, I appreciate all the things that God's allowed us to do. We've done countless things. Donation drives. I mean, it seems like over one after the next after the next. But we're doing this for the glory of God. Donation drives for Raleigh homeless shelters. Dinners we have provided to women's shelters. Meal after meal has been delivered to families in hospice. Hospice care. We, we've given stuff to workers at hospice. Supply drives for pregnancy centers. Winter coat drives for local schools and local families. Donation drive for Wake Med. Children hospitals went to a local school not too long ago when we fed them all breakfast, all the teachers breakfast. We've done, we're trying to think out of the box. We're doing outreach, taking kids and teens to youth camp every year, every year taking kids. We had one gentleman in the church said, I want to pay for every teenager and every kid to go to youth camp. I want to tell you, God sees your works. He sees what you do. Y'all help me preach. Did it all in the name of Jesus. We've got a thriving senior ministry. Really good senior ministry. I mean, they're doing stuff all the time. I wish I was a senior in some ways because they're doing, all, doing stuff all the time. Thriving children's ministries. Got a wonderful children director, children pastor. Sister Amby do, doing a great Amber, doing a great job. Thriving teen ministry. Doing a wonderful. Thriving music ministry. The choir's doing great. The band is playing great. Thriving women's and men's ministries. Doing wonderful. We got good teaching and good preaching. Got good music. And we got stuff for all ages. Somebody told me uh, a, a long time ago, they said, if you want to have a good church, you've got to have something for every age. And that's what we're trying to do. We're doing this for, for, the God and, for God. And I want to tell you, I'm proud. I'm proud of you as a church. And I'm proud of this church. And I'm proud of the difference that we have made for God. And I'm proud of the families who have been blessed. And I'm proud of the times that you've drug yourself in here. And you may not have feel like singing in the choir. You may not have felt like sitting there and listening to me preach. But you sat there anyways and you said amen and you encouraged me anyways. I want to tell you I'm proud of this church. And I love this church. And I think God is looking down from heaven and smiling and saying I know your works. And I know what you've done. Because everything, everything I listed, we're doing it for the glory of God. We're not doing it just to do it. I am, you, you should know me by now. I don't do stuff just to do it. That's crazy. I do stuff for the glory of God. And I do it to magnify the Lord and to lift him on high. And why am I saying all this? Why do I, why do I go through all that? Because the devil all the times make you feel like we're not doing enough. You ever been there before? You're not doing nothing for God. You're not doing nothing. Look at them. Look at what they're doing. But sometimes we have to remember, even right now, this morning, think of where you are. You made up your mind to go to the house of the Lord, and you're sitting in house, the house of the Lord to give God glory. Everything we've done is because of the glory of God. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Jesus says, I know your works. He says to the church at Ephesus, I know your works of good. I know the shattered lives that you have, have comforted. I know the souls that have been changed because of your witness. I know the dedication of every single Sunday school teacher, every Wednesday night teacher. I know the dedication of every children's worker, every usher, every elder, every prayer warrior, every altar worker. Whenever you come around the altar and lay your hands on somebody's shoulder, God says, I know that and I see that. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? Jesus sees the offering that you give. Brother Jay, God sees every time that you 
you go out there and cut the grass on a Saturday. God sees every time that you, you, you clean the bathroom. God sees every time that we vacuum the floor. God sees every time that we haul the trash away. God sees our works. God notices what you do. And you may say, nobody cares. Nobody sees. There is one in heaven who sees what you do and is proud of your works. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning. Every offering you give, he knows when you showed up and you didn't feel like it. He knows every sacrifice of praise. He sees every lifted hand. He hears every lifted voice. He sees and he hears and he knows every lifted prayer that you give to him. He knows the tears you cry. Every stress, every worry, every pain, every detail, every moment, Jesus knows. And Jesus, through the word of God this morning that he laid on my heart to tell this church is he sees your works. So keep up the good works. Then Jesus says, I know your labor. What's the difference between work and labor? There's a lot. There's a lot of difference between work and labor. You can work all day long. You can go to work for eight hours and leave, but you ain't labored. How many knows that to be true? All right. Labor is to work with intense exertion over a prolonged period of time. Labor brings weariness. Labor means working beyond 8 to 5. Giving more than what is expected of you. Jesus says, I know your works. And he says, I know your labor. Did you know, concerning work, that nothing will work in your life until you work? Did you know that? And the only place that you'll find success before work is in the dictionary. Ephesus, they had works. They could labor. Then Jesus says, I know your patience. And what that word patience means is is persistence or endurance. Everybody shout endurance real loud. (laughs) Jesus says, I know your works. And then he says, I know your endurance. I'm preaching on works, endurance, and love this morning. Ability might get you to the top. Talent might get you to the top. But what keeps you as a top is endurance. It's persistence. It's showing up and going forward and keep fighting. Ability may get you to the top, but only endurance will keep you there. Persistence overcomes resistance. In every aspect of your life, you're going to have resistance. But what you've got to do is stand flat-footed, put your face like a flint, and say that I'm going forward with Jesus and I'm going on with Him. The further back that you pull the bow, the farther the arrow will fly. Did you know that? A rubber band isn't worth anything until it's stretched. How many has ever grabbed a rubber band and going to use it? As soon as you stretch it, it just breaks. What do you do? You throw the thing in the trash. Let me tell you this morning. Your life, my life, we're going to endure hardness as Christian soldiers. But we've got to press ahead. It's not going to be sugar-coated all the time. It's not going to be roses and lollipops all the time. But through every hardness as a Christian soldier, you've got to march on. You've got to keep pressing. You've got to put one foot in front of the other and endure and Jesus said those that endure till the end the same shall be saved praise God that he gives us the ability to endure falling down doesn't make you a failure staying down makes you a failure rejoice not against me O my enemies when I fall I shall arise when I sit in darkness the Lord shall be a light unto me you fall down get back up ain't no shame in falling down the shame's when you stay down amen Somebody help me preach this morning. You'll never possess what you don't pursue. Life is not easy all the time. And serving God's not always wonderful. But you got to endure. There are some storms, some storms, some times when things go wrong. And if it seems like it's one thing goes wrong, the next thing goes wrong. And it's, if it's not ticks, it's fleas. If something else goes wrong, something else goes wrong. And sometimes that's the way life is, but... God didn't call you just give up whenever things get rough. It's like riding a roller coaster. You get on the roller coaster. You don't get off in the middle of that roller coaster. You'll kill yourself. You ride that thing out till it comes back to the station again. You just got to sometimes sit, sometimes wait, sometimes wait and bear it, and then things will get better. That's the way it goes sometimes. That's life. And God is not looking for wimps. God is not looking for pansies. God is not looking for wallflowers. God is not looking for people who are just going to hang in there with us for a couple of weeks and then vanish and evaporate with the wind. God is looking for those that are going to hold on, that are going to put their hand to the plow, look forward, and don't look back. That's what God's. That's endurance. That's what, what endurance is. Jesus said any man put his hand to the plow and looking back, not fit for the kingdom of heaven. Wow. God, help me to have a grip on the plow. Those who have patience, 
Those who have endurance, integrity, perseverance, persistence overcomes resistance. You've got to have endurance. A tiny seed that is planted. Think about a tiny seed that's planted in the soil. It's got to persevere. has to endure. As it grows, it's got to fight past the rocks. Push away the hard dirt to get to the sunshine and to the air. And once that little seed, that, that seedling pops out, push past the dirt, then it's got to contend with the frost. It's got to contend with the wind. It's got to contend with all the elements. And then after it's persevered, after it's endured, and it grows and grows and grows, that's what God has for you and I. That's what God's telling us to do is to persevere, to endure. And then we'll be like a mighty oak tree and a mighty cedar tree for the Lord. The church of Ephesus was striving amazingly. They had works. They had labor. They had patience. But Jesus had a grievance with them. Jesus said, you're doing good. You're doing good. You're doing good. Everything's good. And you know, that's, that's, a, that's, some, that's something to, to be thankful for. But Jesus is saying, there's just something that's not right here. Something not right. And in verse number four, Jesus says, nevertheless, I have something against you. Because you have left your first love. Don't you notice those words? Jesus didn't say you lost your love. When you lose your love, it's, you, know, you can't, when you lost something, it's lost. Jesus said you walked away from your love. You got so busy doing and doing and doing that you left love on the back burner. You got to have love, church. And I don't want you to get this message mis misinterpreted. You, you've got to have works. You, you do. You've, you've got to show God that you mean business. You've got to have endurance. You've got to stick in there with God. You've got to have your hand welded to the word of God. You've got to have your soul welded to the mission of God. But on top of that, you've got to have love. Because if you don't have love, then none of it, none of it matters. And I preach the way I preach. Because I love you. And I say what I say. Because I love you. And if I didn't love you. I wouldn't care about you. And I just get up here and preach stuff that makes you feel good. Yeah. And I get up here and preach stuff that's easy to preach. You know it's not easy to preach some of the stuff that I preach sometimes. Because your responses tell me that it's not easy. Because sometimes it's. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to get up here and make you smile and make you laugh and tell you stories and tell you jokes and never, never press you, never step on your toes. Because I was talking to somebody behind the church over there. They said, man, you step on my toes. It hurts a little bit. And I, I tell you this, sometimes it hurts for me to step on your toes. Because I don't just throw it out there and say, well, they'll handle it and that's it. They'll get over it. No, I pray about this stuff, church. I think about what I preach to you. I wrestle over this stuff, what I preach to you. Sometimes God puts messages on my heart, and I'm thinking, man, I'd much rather preach something else than besides what you put on my heart. But you know what I've got to do? I've got to be obedient to the word of God. I've got to be obedient to the voice of God. Because it's not going to help you in the, in the long run for me to just sugarcoat everything and just tell you don't worry about this and don't worry about that. There are some things that you better be cognizant of, that you better worry about, that you better get right, and you better get straight. Because the kingdom of heaven will not suffer some things. There's some things that will not enter in to the kingdom of heaven. And God forbid one day you're outside of the kingdom of heaven. You don't say, man, that little preacher down there in that, that little church, I wish he would have told me. And I don't want to get to the place where I stand before God and I got blood on my hands because I didn't tell you what God told me to tell you. Because before I give it to you, God gives it to me. All right, let me get back to what I was talking about. You ready for this? Yeah. One's ready. You ready for this this morning? Jesus said, I got something against you because you left your first love. Jesus told the church of Ephesus, you remember to work, you remember to have uh, endurance, you remember to have patience, but you forgot love. You left out love. And this wasn't just going on in Ephesus, this is going on everywhere. And Paul wrote, I mean, people have a propensity and a tendency and are apt to do things, especially in church and especially concerning God, without love. You gotta have love, church. Do you believe that this morning? You gotta have love. 
Paul said, though I speak with the tongue of men and angels and have not love, I'm a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. He said, though I can have all these wonderful talents and gifts, but if it's not seasoned with love, it means absolutely nothing. If you don't have love, then you don't have anything. Nothing. Emptiness. Bare and desolate. And when we leave out love, either individually, corporately, as a church, anything we do, we just do it to do it. You know what that is? That's a form of godliness. But we're denying the power of God. Because the power of the gospel is in the love that Jesus has for us. Ephesus, they were on the right trajectory. They lost their power source. They were pointed in the right direction, but they lost steam and they lost their engine. In the Old Testament, in Isaiah chapter number one, we see a God that was, was sick and tired of his people just going through the motions. How many of you know what it's like to just go through the motions, go through the motions? He says in chapter one, your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hateth. They are trouble to me. I'm weary to bear them. In other words, God was saying, I'm sick of the sacrifices. I'm sick of the emptiness of this religion. But in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, God says, just come to me and let's reason it all out. Though your sins are as scarlet, I can make them white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I can make them as wool. And you know what God was saying? Let's just have a relationship. All you got to do is just love me and I want to let you know church how many of you know this morning that there's some things in life that if you don't give it's not going to come back to you and love is one of those things if you don't show love then love's not going to come back to you the Bible says give and it shall be given unto you pressed down shaken together and running over you know what that scripture means it means if you give and mainly we use that scripture a lot talking about money but mainly that scripture is talking about love it's talking about mercy. In other words, Jesus is saying, if you don't show love, then there's no love going to come your way. If you don't show mercy, there's no mercy going to come your way. An old, old, old pastor told me one time, he said, he said, Brother Adam, he said, it's always better to show grace because you don't know when you're going to need grace. What I'm telling you is that if you don't show grace, you're not going to get grace back. And there's another scripture somewhere in, this, in the Bible that says, and I think I talked about it a couple weeks ago. It says that if you don't forgive, then God's not going to forgive you. There's a lot of stuff in the Bible that works that way. It's like the principle of sowing and reaping. You got a handful of seed and you throw it out there. I mean, if you put it in your pocket, you're not going to receive nothing. But if you cast it out there and you till it and you fertilize it and, you know, let the sun shine on it, it'll, it'll grow. It'll grow. It'll grow. But I'm... What I'm telling you this morning, works are important. Endurance is important. Love's important. Got to have love. Could I have an amen? amen? Almost done. I told you I was going to lighten up on you. Do you know what Paul thought about some of the people at Ephesus? In 1 Corinthians 15 and 32, he said, After the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. He's saying there are people at the church of Ephesus that remind me of wild animals. Paul's saying there's people at the church of Ephesus that remind me of beasts in the way that they act. And the way that they deal with one another. They were so mean, so ugly one to another. They had no love, some of these people. They had become like beasts, animals, heartless, soulless, and loveless. And that's what happens when we leave out love. When you try to raise your children without love, you're going to raise a beast. You hearing what I'm saying? I've seen the movie. You've seen the movie. Beauty and the Beast. How many has ever seen that movie before? Couple people. Come on, come on. You know you've seen that movie. World. How long have I been preaching? Ah, uh, that's it. That's it. It's past 12. Goodness. 
please just give me, give me a couple more minutes. How many give me a minute? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> I should have said how many give, you, give me five minutes. All right, I got, a, I got a couple more minutes here. So let's try this again. Let's restart. How many of you have seen the movie Beauty and the Beast? So we know, we, I don't have to tell you. So it's about a beast. He's cursed, right? He's got a curse on him. Then there's a beauty. The only way for that beast to shed that curse is for him to have somebody love him. That's the only way. So there's a beast and then there's a beauty. God has called us to be the beauty. God didn't call us to be the beast. And at your job and in your home, in your family, when you go out in public, there's beasts everywhere. They look like beasts. They act like beasts. They're just, just like beasts. But God didn't call you to be a beast. God called you to be the beauty. Because the scripture says God will beautify the meek with salvation. And if you've been saved, then you've been beautified with meekness. And so when you encounter these beasts wherever you go, you know what your job is? To love them. Not to try to change them. Not to try to transform them. Not to try to get them saved. Your job is to love them. Because when you love them, Something miraculous happens, and that's when God begins to do his work. As many of you this morning are saved because somebody took the time out to love you. Somebody took the time out to show you some attention. When you thought that you were unlovable, somebody loved you. When I thought nobody cared about me, there was a youth pastor and a youth pastor's wife that cared about me and loved me and showed me love. Changed my life. So this morning... I want to tell you, don't forget love. And all that you do, when you deal with these people at work, don't forget that you are supposed to be the beauty. You deal with your family that you, you, you get on your nerves, don't forget that you are supposed to be the beauty. It's not your job to clean them. It's not your job to change them. It's your job to love them. And then let God do the rest. Amen. Works without love don't matter. Endurance without love don't matter. So this morning I've talked about three things. Works, endurance, and love. And I'm going to give you a chance to respond to this message as we have our altar service. Close your eyes. Bow your heads. Maybe you're here this morning and you feel like you've not done enough. There's a constant nagging in the pit of your stomach and there's a constant voice in your head that says you're not doing enough for God. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. And The best thing, church, I want to tell you the best remedy that you could ever have to this voice that says you're not doing enough is for you to do something and start this morning. Go to the altar and ask God to help you. Ask God to put something in your heart. Ask God to touch you and help you and change you. Maybe this morning you're struggling with endurance persistence you've been going on your own strength your own ability and it's not served you well things are hindering you people are hindering you and every time you feel like you just get started good then something knocks you off course and something knocks you in a rut the reason is is because you've been trying to do it on your own strength this morning the best thing that you could do is to ask God God give me your strength help me where I'm at Help me to endure. Give me the strength that only comes from you. Give me the endurance that only comes from you. And maybe this morning, church, you're fine with works. You're fine with endurance, but you, you just lack in love. You're just lacking love. You've lost your love. You've left your love. You used to have a passion for things, but it's, it's nowhere. It's flatlined. You used to have dreams. You used to have ambitions. You used to care. You used to have love but you've left it. And the good thing about this is Jesus said you didn't lose your love. You left your love. And you can go back and get it this morning. I want to ask you, as God's dealt with me over this message, maybe God's dealing with you as well. 
Jesus says, I've got one thing against you. You left your first love. This morning, how about this? How about we just stir up that gift of God that he has put inside of you? How about we fan the flame? And if you need something from the Lord this morning, this is the perfect place to get it. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till you get home. The presence of God is in this place. And sometimes it's just as simple as this. God, will you help me? God, will you heal me? God, will you fix it? God, will you change it? Stand with me this morning. I want everybody that will. Everyone that will. Everyone that will. Everyone that loves Jesus, everyone that needs something from Jesus, I want you to make your way down to this altar this morning. Don't be ashamed. Don't be inhibited. Don't be afraid. Ask God to meet you. Ask God to heal you. Ask God to help you. Maybe you haven't been working as much as you need to. Maybe you haven't had as much faith as you need to. Maybe your love is not there. Maybe your passion is not there. Maybe your dreams are gone. Maybe you've lost your zeal. Maybe you've lost your, your fervor. Maybe you've lost your tenacity. Maybe you're just going through the motions today. Possibly you're just, just walking and walking numb. Maybe you're numb this morning and you need God to touch you. He's able to do that and so much more. God, I ask you that you bless this church. That you bless these people that have come this morning. I ask you, Jesus, let's pour it out to God. I just ask you this morning, church, just pour it out to God. Take this time seriously. Take this time sincerely. Don't worry about those who are beside of you or who may be looking. Why don't you worship Jesus? Pour it out to the feet of Jesus this morning. Lay it on this altar. Let God handle it. Let God take care of it. See, God can't handle it if you don't give it to Him. He's not going to pry it from your fingers. He's not going to force it from you. This morning, Lord, I lay it down at the altar.